Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to our time of worship here at Cornerstone Methodist Church. It's an absolute joy to see you all and to be here present with you. I uh, hope you're all well. <laughs> Even behind the mask, you're all well. Yes, good. It's fabulous to be here to worship the Lord. <coughs> a couple of... Yeah, okay. Uh, just a few announcements. Quite a few of you will have hopefully received an email yesterday uh, concerning a decision which we might need to take as a church council. Uh, you may or may not be a member of church council. We will be very grateful for your responses. And if anyone is a member of church council and hasn't received an email, please uh, will you let either myself or Wendy know. It concerns uh, replacing uh, the condemned... A hot air a boiler uh, uh, in church. There's enough hot air, we might think, uh, from the pulpit, but uh, we do need hot air through the rest of the building too. Uh, and we sort of uh, managed to jiggle some figures around. Thank you, Wendy and Michael, for your endeavour with that, and, and Ron too, to sort of keep within a budget that we sort of set to one side at a previous church council. Uh, so that's, that's the detail of it. If you've received an email, please respond. And if you haven't, please let us know. <clears throat> the, uh, thank you for those who've made contributions to the food bank. That's really generous of you. Um, most, most appreciated. But we have come. We are in Advent season. We've come to worship the Lord, to uh, hear his word and sing his praises and to be moved by the Holy Spirit. We are on the third Sunday in Advent. Yes, there are only two candles lit at present, but we will soon remedy that. Jesus said, I do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Amen. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world, a light no darkness can ever put out. Now if we got uh, someone to play, uh, or we could sing, I would be encouraging you to sing uh, the Advent uh, hymn, <coughs> Advent Candles, but I'll read you the first three verses. Advent candles tell their story as we watch and pray, longing for the day of glory. Come, Lord, soon we say. Pain and sorrow, tears and sadness, changed for gladness on that day. Prophet voices loudly crying, making pathways clear, glimpsing glory, self-denying, calling all to hear. Through their message, challenge shaken, hearts awaken, God is near. John the Baptist, by his preaching and by water poured, brought to those who heard his teaching news of hope restored. Keep your vision strong and steady and be ready for the Lord. A prayer. Are we there yet? Lord Jesus, John the Baptist, brought news of your coming and of hope restored. May our vision be strong and steady, ready for you. Amen. <clears throat> well, we've lit three candles. Um, here's a bit of a, a quiz for you. How would... Um, we have four candles through Advent, uh, all have some sense of symbol. I wonder if anybody would want to say what we, they think the first three might represent. Love. Love could be one, one way of looking at it. Yes, so we think about the fruits of the Spirit, love. Hope, joy, and the final one would be peace. 
if you were looking at in that, that direction, which is quite a correct way of doing it. Uh, another way of looking at it is the th first candle being a reminder of God's people in creation as we think of God and all that he has bestowed upon us through our lives. Uh, the second one would be for the prophet's word, the, the scripture which enables us to, to hear God and to be in communion with him and to respond. And the third candle is lit uh, to remind us of the forerunner, John the Baptist. Um, we'll have some word of scripture uh, about John in a short while. And the fourth candle, which sometimes is pink, is to represent Mary. Come on, have confidence, Mary. Absolutely. And then the, the final candle in the middle is white, and that's for Jesus, light of the world. Well, as you know, John the Baptist was the forerunner. He was um, Jesus' cousin. Uh, he, John the Baptist's uh, mother was Elizabeth, a uh, cousin uh, uh, of, of Mary. And, of course, Mary has gone to visit Elizabeth, uh, and they both discover that they're both miraculously uh, pregnant, um, especially so for Elizabeth, who is in her old age, I think Scripture says. Uh, her husband, uh, Zachariah, um, does what every good husband should do when his wife is pregnant. He falls silent for the whole period <laughs> and lets her get on with it. Uh, says he. <laughs> he falls silent for the whole period until uh, the child is born and he's asked uh, what he should be called and he's named John. And then Zachariah, after those months of silence, uh, bursts into song and it's known as the Benedictus. Uh, and we are going to share together in that canticle now. If you could um, join in the words in the, the darker font. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people to set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to forgive the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace glory to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and shall be forever amen and uh, this uh, liturgical year which always starts on the first sunday of advent uh, we work our commence working our way through uh, uh, one of the synoptic gospels this year it is mark's gospel uh, which I, I rejoice at because i uh, i would say mark is one of my, my favorite um, uh, books of the bible and uh, not least because it's so clear concise it has a complete theme that runs through it and and you you get a sense of energy in the in the in the storytelling it starts, for I will share with you the first uh, eight verses, in a fabulous way. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What a way to start a book. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark leaves his readers in no doubt as to what is to come. Good news and whom it's about, Jesus Christ, 
the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you to prepare the way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the throng of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. A glorious opening to a gospel message, which starts with the most vivid description of a character who we wends his way in and out of the story. John the Baptist. We probably have the most clear description of John than we have of anyone else in the whole of the Bible. We know exactly what he looks like. Clothed in camel's hair, leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts <coughs> and wild honey and lived in the wilderness. There's no doubt, and other descriptions uh, le lead us to, to conclude this um, this really enigmatic figure who declares quite a strong message of repentance, asking people to turn around, to amend their ways, to get their hearts ready and their lives ready and their patterns of worship ready to receive the longed for, long promised, long expected Messiah into their lives. John is asking people to make a big change. Here is an eye test for you. Do you prefer this or this? This or this? I wonder which of these two pathways you would prefer to walk along. The first is seems to be very rough. You might stumble as you went and it is uneven in so many ways. You would almost need to have one leg shorter than the other to, to transfer that, that particular section of that road. We put many obstacles in the pathways of God even if we think we're vaguely going in the right direction. We can so e easily stumble and lose our grip and our direction. Perhaps better then is this pathway, even though it is still leading us uphill and we're not quite certain as to what the direction or what it is or what is beyond the horizon. But nonetheless, it is clearly marked, smooth, and you could follow it perhaps even in the darkness, for as we will discover, the light will shine in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. John asked people to make straight their lives in order that they can walk most clearly and focused in the way, the pathways that Jesus will declare to them. We're going to uh, hear, and I hope everything is connected and working properly, the, the hymn on Jordan's banks.
another image of, of John the Baptist. Uh, that was one I think I, I took when I was at uh, St Mark's Basilica in Venice, and some happy memories of that that time too. Um, there, just telling people what they need to do, even if his voice was like one crying out into the wilderness. Sandra, I don't know how you feel sometimes preaching as to whether you're in the wilderness or whether you're just speaking into the wilderness and not necessarily certain as to how people are responding or hearing. But nonetheless, John the Baptist must have been particularly successful uh, because even though it looks like he was doing a hopeless task in a hopeless place, we nonetheless continue in his tradition that he started of of baptism being the sign of people's entry into the church, his, his teaching, his methods, his thought processes have truly stood the test of time and still we baptise in the name of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit may pour, be poured upon um, lives and people find their new pathways within the fellowship um, of faith. Here's perhaps a different image. Uh, some of you do know uh, that I enjoy something of uh, the, the Star Wars um, the films. Um, I like them not necessarily for all the uh, killing and action and lightsabering and all of that, but rather because it's always a bit of a spiritual battle. Uh, George Lucas would declare that there was no theology at all intended in his writing. It was just simply a good story. However, the portrayal of the characters, uh, particularly through the films, is, uh, I think, deeply theological in, in its thought process. First and foremost, we have this idea of, of the force, the, the Holy Spirit, if I would do a Christian uh, analogy, that somehow is a lifeblood li living and running through all people, whereby they can make a choice between light and dark, the good side or the dark side of, of the force in Star Wars terminology. And you can tell perhaps who the people of light are, because they're always wearing light, white clothing. And you know the people of darkness because they're always dressed very darkly, uh, with the exception of Alec Guinness, who has this sort of monk-like cowl around him, because, of course, he's a teacher of the spirit. <coughs> and so the battles commence between light and darkness. Which way will you turn is, is the theme running through most of the films. And, of course, most characters have a choice as to which way they turn, as indeed we are all given that same freedom of choice. John is asking us to follow Christ. Here I'll get back to a more classic image. I think this is Raphael as a picture of John the Baptist. Um, a bit more angelic-like really, isn't it? Um, and you just notice that he's coming out of the darkness into light. It's about emerging from a former way being of being into the light. And although the gaze is fixed, especially upon whoever's viewing the picture, the arm movement is a very distinct pointing upwards to the heavens. And here is where you should be looking. This is the way. Follow Christ. Much more modern image where Jesus is at the center of the light of the star. The light of the star that's coming, we know, to shine over the stable in Bethlehem. And uh, that star is made up of uh, one of the verses from the opening of John's Gospel when we think of Jesus coming as light and light to the world and bringing with him some of those Advent. Um, those themes that you mentioned early on, uh, Trish, uh, and others, hope, love, peace, joy, grace. We know we can receive all of that when we accept Christ into our lives. It's a strange image, I've lost it. Uh, this was of the interior of um, 
the cathedral at Lich, uh, Liverpool, the Roman Catholic cathedral, where it feels quite dark inside it, within this round building. Has anyone been inside? So, so you know, it, it, it's almost circular in its form with this sort of teepee type roof. Uh, and the light comes just about along some of the sides, but most particularly through, through a central lantern which shines light down through the suspended uh, cr crown of thorns onto the central uh, altar. And it really is about the light of Christ beaming down through sacrifice and love onto the, the place uh, where, where the sacrament will be celebrated. Uh, a really important way of, of reading uh, the, the premises. We start first and foremost with the word of God that we receive, that we receive in so many ways, but perhaps especially uh, through our understanding, our reading, our, our learning of of scripture, of the Bible. Hopefully that's why you come on Sundays and why Sandra and I and Joan and others spend time preparing to lead people into what we hope would be a good exploration of scripture. We start with word and scripture and that will lead us to uh, be built up within our faith, to know more clearly the, the presence of God in our lives in order that we might be able to declare something of our faith which might be as simple as Jesus is Lord or we might uh, be able to recite something of the longer creed we believe in God the Father creator of heaven and earth we believe in Jesus Christ his son we believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord the giver of life and so forth we are built up in our faith in that way and we build ourselves up in our faith as people of light as we come to worship to praise Christ, God and Christ and to pray for ourselves and others. We are in communion with God in those moments especially and especially when we can do it corporately too. We find a deeper understanding of God through his transforming ordinances, as Wesley will write, that we find within uh, the two sacraments of the Methodist Church of Baptism and Holy Communion. It has been, it feels to me, a lean period of doing that this year. And perhaps within this circuit, it's a very lean period in terms of baptism. We would long to quickly get back to the point where we can celebrate sacraments so easily. For it gives us, makes us one with Christ. And when we've done all of that, we can start to respond to all of that gift and graces that we have received, all of that goodness which God bestows upon us by doing deeds of faith, discipleship which can happen in so many ways. It might just be that you put a tin of soup in a food bank box. It might just be that you phone someone up and say, and how are you today? No, really, how are you today? It could be in so many ways. And of course, we most particularly would wish to share something of our faith with those around us, around us, beyond these walls, this community. I'm really um, thrilled really that we have made such good links with the school. We're making links now with the community centre and I actually have a physical meeting, meeting someone one face to face tomorrow, how marvellous that will be, to think about how we might work with the school and the community centre for this community and be a conversation we will share uh, in coming months. I've had a request from a group who would like to come and meet here uh, for uh, a cause which is, I think, of a particularly Methodist nature, that of Alcoholics Anonymous. Can we? Should we? Can we? Should we? We have the encouragement uh, that 
that we might just be able to start uh, uh, after school's Lego Church too. I've got the Lego because it was on offer at Tesco's. I've thought of Wendy and thrift and thought, well, it's, well, it's cheap, I'm buying it. <laughs> uh, and I've bought it. So we'll see where we go. But there's all of that. It's something about sharing, isn't it? About, 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 about showing something of our response to the nature of God's mercy and grace we find in Christ in the way in which we are. And there are many other ways we do it too. Such as recording services and then putting them onto c- CDs and taking them around. And all of this, we just say thank you, God, for all the blessings we have received. That we can see you most powerfully in all of creation, in the people we meet, in the, in the way in which we are together, in the goodness that we receive each and every day. And yes, the lights of Christ, the lights and the love of God will shine through the darkness. That is a, another interior view of the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Liverpool. Uh, where you can actually always just see out for the windows go right down to floor level you you have this very sacred space but actually you can always see out you can see the movement of the city beyond and even amongst all the darkness there is always light shining in too you are most powerfully always aware of the presence of God when you are there And so too we may truly know the presence and the light and the love of God shining into our lives. Even in the midst of pandemic and chaos that is. And we can truly, truly rejoice and share that rejoicing and light with others. I'm hoping this lift to God the thoughts and the concerns of our hearts we pray for those who we know who are ill in body mind and spirit comfort them strengthen them heal them raise them to a newness of life and we pray for this church that we may be that beacon of light. 
singing only of God's glory and calling people to be able to declare Jesus is Lord. We say together the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen We are going to uh, conclude um, this service as we hear the hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending.